um, we're all participating together and all uh, feeling what it is to be in community with each other. So, um, so welcome to everybody. Uh, if you are able to watch, um, it looks like it just popped up saying that we are at least um, live on YouTube, which is, is a good step. Um, if you are able to watch, uh, please tweet any of your comments to the hashtag creating the future. Um, if you want to think about things for a little while and post later, um, you can post that at our blog. But right now, the only thing that we're looking at is Twitter. So, um, so we're grateful to that. Um, and we've got a, a whole bunch of people here today. So welcome to, to everybody who is with us today. Um, let's start where we generally start, which is talking about what's been powerful and wonderful and awesome. And it could be uh, awesome in a, um, in a scary way, in a, in, a, in a sad way. It could be awesome in a excited way. Um, but let's just share a little bit of what, what is alive in our lives right now. Um, and if we could start with, um, if you feel comfortable doing so, a, um, a land acknowledgement. And I say, if you feel comfortable doing so, because I know some people um, are, are new to um, our way of, of being here and may not, uh, may not know the answer. So if you, if you can um, respond first by telling us where you are, um, whose traditional lands um, we are sitting on, which is such an important thing. We are meeting virtually, but each of us is sitting on on lands that were someone else's before us. Um, and yes, Carl, even you. Um, <laughs> so um, if we could just start by saying uh, where we are, if you want to say a little bit about what the weather is like, and then share a little bit of um, what is exciting in your life these days. And um, I'm going to uh, choose some people. Um, and um, uh, so, so rather than just have us popcorn around, um, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling here. Um, Angie, would you start? Tell us uh, where you are and yeah. it's exciting. Thank you, Hildy. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, and um, uh, on Omaha land, Sioux, Paga, several tribes were um, around here and trying to continue to do my best to work towards hopefully reparations ultimately. Um, and uh, and I am really, I, uh, the weather's pretty nice here and I won't take away too much, Stephanie from Thunder. You can jump in with other weather updates. Um, I, my awesome, I have two awesomes. One is a personal awesome. I just took a quick trip to Denver to see a concert at Red Rocks, which is really exciting. You know, we had made these, uh, we, we had booked the tickets like a year ago and we had been stuck at home for so long, you know, <laughs> um, looking forward to a time we could go out and do things again. So that was really exciting, but also like a oh, quick trip to Denver, eight hours there, eight hours back. Um, but awesome, awesome uh, concert. Brandy Carlisle is who we went to see. And my second awesome is that, and I, I hope I don't steal your the thunder too much, Hildy, but I wanted to introduce Stephanie. Um, Stephanie's here uh, from also, she's at UN University of Nebraska at Omaha with me. And actually we had a class that we took together in fundraising um, last semester. Uh, and, uh-oh, Stephanie, are you still there? Oh, I'm gonna kind of lost her. But Stephanie is really active uh, on campus and working on a project with the Omaha Community Foundation that uh, some of our um, faculty are working on too with her um, on capacity building, especially focused on engaging um, leaders of color in the nonprofit sector uh, here. And then also um, uh, really active with Partnership for Hope, which is a, an organization that works with young adults who are aging out of the foster care system and Stephanie's on the board of that. And so Stephanie had so many great contributions to our class and our class discussions. And I'm really excited that she's able to be here today to join us for this discussion. And maybe if it's okay with you, Stephanie, you wanna do a, tell us about your awesome or anything else? Yeah, sure. Um, I think you covered a lot of it. Uh, my, my connection broke up a second, but I'm back, so. Um, yeah, I also have been helping um, this summer with um, the Omaha Community Foundation with a little bit of grant writing, which is super exciting to me. Um, and um, 
with Partnership for Hope, we're in the making of a strategic plan. So I'm very involved and excited about that as well. And then the continuation of research has just been a great experience um, at the University of Nebraska Omaha. Um, and Dr. Eikenberry covered the Sioux and Ponca Omaha area tribes. Um, that's the area that I'm in as well. Um, so I am just happy to be here and hope to be able to contribute anything useful to the conversation. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you both of you. Um, it's great to have you both here. Um, let's go to uh, Justin. Thank you, Hildy. Thank you, Stephanie, for uh, joining us. Um, so I am Justin Pollock. Uh, I am um, following in the footsteps of using land that was originally used by the Nakach tank, which is now Washington, D.C. And um, my, my exciting is that my two daughters are back in school in person. And it is like night and day in terms of the curiosity and learning that is going on. They have things to talk about. They're excited about what they're doing. Uh, I kind of jokingly say that they've gone off to school and I know more about what's going on in their classrooms and what they're learning than when they spent a year in the room right upstairs from me learning online. So um, I am keeping my fingers crossed that uh, we are able to continue safely in this kind of environment because uh, it is exciting to see my children excited about learning again. Wonderful, wonderful. It is exciting. It's, it's exciting and scary all at once, <laughs> which I think is, is life these days. Um, let's go to Mark. Mark has uh, been part of, quietly part of our Creating the Future community for a while now. Um, it's taken at least one class that I know of and, um, and participating in several ways. And so I'm really, really happy that you are here with us. And if you could um, just say hello and uh, tell us where you are and a little bit about what is awesome and meaningful in your life these days. Yeah, thanks, Hildy. This is an honor, and I'm glad to meet everybody. Uh, I watched uh, four or five months worth of um, videos from y'all, so I know everybody by face at least. Um, I'd like to know where Eli got his headset because it always sounds like he's in my head when I listen to him. That's always a good thing for world domination. Um, I'm on the Korchog land, uh, which is part of the Iroquois Nation, which runs up from Long Island, where I am. Uh, the North Fork of Long Island, out through New York City and upstate. Uh, and, and I just learned that it's part of the Haudenosaunee um, group as well. And I've started following a few of their leaders uh, over the last couple of months. Um, I, I've got the wrong word in the, in the beginning of this. I don't remember if it should be stewardship or responsibility, but uh, my responsibility is to leave our children's grandchildren a home that they will love. My grandson just turned three. Wow, wonderful. Oh, how exciting. How exciting. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Um, so let's go to the man with the, the powerful headset, Eli. Um, it's good to see you. If you could tell us where you are and what's what's meaningful in your life these days. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to meet you, Stephanie. Welcome to the group. Uh, thanks, Mark. I'll try not to uh, destroy anyone's eardrums. Um, I am in Alameda, California. And uh, previously, this was uh, Ohlone um, land. Um, and uh, my awesome is uh, recently I had my executive assistant, um, who was from Colombia, come to visit us and spent about uh, six weeks with us. And for her 30th birthday, we took her skydiving in Lodi. So that was a, an incredible uh, confrontation of fear. Uh, and we all survived it. <laughs> um, and, and, it, and it really uh, put things in perspective. When you're up there, you're looking down at, you know, um, at the land and, and there's, a, there's a feeling of, of, um, of being one with it um, and kind of like facing this uh, really, really challenging uh, experience. Um, and also I was able to go to, uh, to Bottle Rock for the first time um, and I got to see Guns N' Roses live. So those are my two awesomes and I'm glad to be here with all of you. Oh, wow. Uh, life is always exciting around you. <laughs> oh, although jumping out of an airplane just it increases the level of excitement. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to go back again. It's amazing. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Um, we'll hop over to Elaine Cates. It is um, really delightful to have you. Elaine, um, like Mark, has been 
uh, of following our work for a long time and involved in different ways, different uh, different meetings, and um, and always enthusiastically. So it is just a, a joy to have you with us. If you could tell us a little bit about where you are and something that's meaningful in your life right now. Thank you, Hildy, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here and. Uh, loving to see all of the faces and, and hear the voices of the faces I can't see. Uh, so I am in Dufferin County in southwestern Ontario, and we sit on the lands of the Teonatate, the Atawandaran, the Haudenosaunee, and the Nishnabis peoples. And um, we are governed by uh, two treaties, the Haldeman Treaty of 1784, and then the two Williams Treaties of 1818, Treaty 18, the Nottawasaga Purchase, and Treaty 19, the Adjutants Treaty. So I'm thrilled to be able to share that with you. Uh, the weather here is awesome, which means I'm golfing this afternoon. So that's one of my awesomes is that I get to go out and golf. Another one is the actual topic of this whole conversation because I host forums quarterly for all of the Dufferin County um, human service organizations and our next forum on the 23rd, we are having a conversation about funding and so this, uh, you know, serendipitous timing of this conversation will help me with that conversation with others. So thank you for doing that. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you for being here. Um, Carl, hello. It is wonderful to see you as always. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. So I'm Carl, uh, Carl Wilding. Uh, I'm creating the Futures European uh, Outpost. Uh, I'm just based outside London uh, in England uh, in a, uh, a small village uh, called Wheat Hampstead where apparently Julius Caesar passed through uh, uh, many hundreds of years ago. Uh, there's a big ditch there. I mean, he made a big impression, uh, but that's the only thing that we've got, uh, though it's a bit of a tourist uh, attraction. Um, I, I can't quite respond to Hilde's opening request that, that uh, we talk about whose lands are we on because... We, of course, are the original sort of taker of other people's lands uh, uh, away from them. Uh, uh, so we, we are on our own land here. Um, I'm, um, I, I, well, I, my awesome, uh, I think a bit like uh, some others, uh, COVID is getting a little bit better here in the UK. So the kids have gone back to school in person. Uh, uh, which is brilliant, though um, one of the signs that you know that you're sort of growing old and decrepit is when they come home and their homework is so hard that you can't read it, never mind, help them uh, uh, with it. So I'm at that stage with the kids at the minute. Um, but my other awesome uh, is that I'm part of a running club. And at the weekend, we took part in a race called the Stampede, where a team of you uh, have to run solidly for 12 hours. Not, not each person running for 12 hours, but as a team, you have to keep taking turns so that you run for over 12 hours. And you can be a team of one, in which case uh, uh, some people uh, did 15 loops of a four-mile track, or you could do a team of four and a team of eight. If you could see me standing up and you see the shape of me, you'll know why I was in a team of eight, because I'm not very fast or, or very fit anymore. And my awesome is that we came last. You finished. <laughs> you finished. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> it's just uh, that's going to be my, my next aspiration to come in last. Something fabulous. <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful. Trey, it is good to see you. Tell us a little bit about where you are, what the weather's like, and, and what has been meaningful for you. Good afternoon, good, or good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. My name is Trey. My feet touch the ground in Treaty 7 territory, which is otherwise known as the place where the Bow and the Elbow Rivers meet. It's been traditional gathering territory for the nations of the Kanai, the Siksika, the Pikani, the Sutsina, and the Stony Nakoda, otherwise known as Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, for myself, I would say what's awesome is actually the weather. I know that sounds crazy. Uh, we had a exceptionally warm summer this year. Uh, 
hotter than normal in August. And literally two weeks ago, the temperature dropped down to almost zero and we were hunkering down for an early winter with virtually no fall. And right now, as it stands, we're experiencing an Indian summer, and I use that term in quotes, and uh, the weather is absolutely stunningly beautiful, and the trees are, the colors are coming out, and the weather is warm, and there's no wind, and the sky is blue, and it is, it's just, stun it's just, we've just had a stunning last three days, and so I'm getting out in that sunshine as much as I possibly can. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, that sounds beautiful. Sounds beautiful. So I can't believe you, it's the beginning of September and you've already frozen. Wow. Wow. And Jackie, Jackie, tell us where you are and a little bit about the weather and what's been meaningful in your life these days. All right. Thank you, Hildy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jackie. Um, so I'm joining the call today from Michigan on the traditional lands of the Wyandot and Anishinaabeg. Um, the weather is pretty good here as well. It's still unseasonably warm for Michigan in the fall, but we are starting to get a little bit of crispness in the air. Uh, not quite like Calgary, though. <laughs> um, and my awesome is that um, our community hosted our first ever event for International Overdose Awareness Day on August 31st. And 27 people got trained on Narcan overdose reversal on that day. So we're a pretty rural community. So that was a big number for us. It was very exciting. Oh, that's huge. That is just huge. Um, one of my awesomes always is Jackie. Uh, for those of you who were not in the room when I introduced Jackie earlier, when we were, when we were sort of off, off screen, um, it, Jackie is our documentarian um, for, the, for the past few meetings and today and hopefully long into the future. And uh, those of you who read the summary of the last meeting, that's Jackie's work. Um, and Jackie keeps up with us without having to say, hey, wait a minute, stop, I didn't get that. Um, and, um, and is always on top of us. So deeply, deeply appreciating that. Um, Dimitri, uh, are, you in, are you in okay shape to tell us <laughs> what's going on with you? Well, obviously my first awesome is we're streaming, we're live and all of that is at least finally working and we'll figure out later what, what, the, what the issues were. Uh, I'm Dimitri Petropoulos. I am talking to you from the traditional lands of the Tawana Otam in uh, Southern Arizona. The Tawana Otam is the second largest tribe in terms of, I believe both land mass uh, or the reservation size. Uh, because their actual land mass is much larger than that because it goes into Mexico and, and uh, here. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I've been thinking, you know, I, I was going to talk about the weather is awesome because the weather here has been so unusually good in terms of rainfall. And, you know, we've had a drought for years and years and years and years. And we have, ex July was the single wettest July in our history. Uh, and we have more rain uh, so far this year than we have had it, it annually for the last probably four or five years, uh, if not before that. So that, that's really cool. But I was really thinking about the whose traditional lands these are. And Hilde and I have been reading a book that has been talking about Chaco Canyon and the people who built Chaco Canyon. And uh, it is a, really a a mind expanding thought process to think about these people who were here in this particular case, it was approximately 1200 B AD that Chaco Canyon was at its peak. Amazing architectural stuff. And they're just finding much of this, uh, archeologically figuring out what all of these great houses mean and whatnot. So my awesome is sort of thinking about all the peoples who have preceded us here and the fact that they were brilliant and that they were sad and they were happy and they were just like us. So that's my awesome is thinking about it in that context. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I am Hildy Gottlieb. I should have introduced myself way earlier. Um, <laughs> I am Hildy Gottlieb and um, like Dimitri, I am on the 
the unceded lands of the Tana Altam. Um, we frequently talk about these as unceded lands, um, which means that they were taken. Um, they were not, not given voluntarily, they were taken. Um, even, even with treaty, um, there was a huge taking um, in many treaties that were not honored. So um, we are sitting on the unceded lands of the Tana Otham uh, here in Tucson, Arizona. Um, and my awesome is a continuation of Dimitri's mentioning of the weather. Um, what the, what the um, un, absolutely unusual amount of rain that we got means that the desert is green. Uh, there are grasses everywhere. You look up at, at mountains that are normally brown and they are just covered with green. The wildflowers have been un, uh, indescribable. Uh, we did not know that there were that many wildflowers that bloom in the summer. We really thought our wildflower season was, was late winter, um, early, early spring. And um, the result of that is Dimitri and I took pretty much every single day this summer, we, we, we took a three week holiday um, out on a road trip. The minute we got home, pretty much every single day we have gone to a different point in the desert to just be inside it. Um, I, I'm a photographer to, to shoot, to just live inside that viewfinder and, and um, how incredibly, incredibly beautiful, beautiful, beautiful it was. It's, it is, I, I can't tell you for somebody who um, lives in a place that is dry, where our normal rainfall is 12 inches a year, 11 inches a year. Um, and um, it, it is just, the air is moist, um, the ground is green, the land is covered with gorgeous flowers. Um, and, and that has really been awesome. It has been a summer of, um, of literally taking every day and just enjoying where we are in a beautiful, beautiful way. So uh, feeling very grateful feeling very grateful for that. I'm grateful for all of you. And uh, if you are watching and are able to tweet to the hashtag creating the future, um, tell us what is meaningful in your lives. Tell us where you are um, and join in the conversation as much as you can. Um, if you are a slow thinker, I tend to be a slow thinker. I like to process. I come up with, with the answer two days later. Um, feel free to post at our blog um, any thoughts that you have. Um, but if you um, want us to see your comment now and incorporate it into the conversation, please use Twitter. It's really the only place that we'll be watching and use the hashtag creating the future. So um, let's dive in to the meat of our discussion. You know what, before we do that, I'm going to do one other thing. I'm going to talk about why we do awesomes because we have so many people here that are um, and new to participating in our conversations. Um, and, and we just take it for granted. We have done this since the beginning, since our first board meetings in 2011, I think it was. So we've got 10 years of awesomes. Um, so many meetings start by getting down to business. We need to get down to business and we don't wanna waste people's time by this touchy feely getting to know each other crap. And when things go to hell in a handbasket, it's because we don't know each other, because we haven't taken time to, to bring ourselves present into the room, to listen to each other's stories, um, to build any kind of trust, to build any kind of connection. And all of that is a recipe for things falling apart. And what we have found over time is the more we take the time to just even get to know each other a little bit, just finding out what, what feels good in your life. Where are you? Um, what does your voice sound like? Uh, so often folks who are new to a meeting are, are, are timid about talking and we don't hear what they sound like until halfway through, three quarters through. Um, so it is, it is very intentional. We start every single one of our meetings touching base on how we're doing, what is meaningful in our lives, because the most important factor in anything is the human factor. Uh, and so bringing that into the room is just really, really important. And it's a big part of catalytic thinking. Um, it, is, um, it is where we're going to start and dive in today in, in our questions about reimagining, resourcing social change. Um, if you took a look at the summary of last meeting is when we really started to be talking about um, if we are going to uh, 
um, significantly resource creating the future. It's where it started. If we're going all, all of our work being an experiment, it all starts with what we're doing is not that unusual from anything anybody else is doing. We have to raise money. We have a board. We have all of these things are so common to everyone. Let's all have that conversation together. Um, if we are to resource our work and do it according to our values, that is a conversation that seems to be rampant throughout, um, and not just the nonprofit world, the social enterprise world, the, the, the social business world, uh, folks who are just looking to um, live their values, live the values that we want to see in the world. What would funding and resourcing look like? And the last time we got together, we talked about um, that first question in catalytic thinking, who will be affected if we have this conversation, if we are able to find a way to reimagine funding, um, who will be affected by that? And we came up with a long list that you can see in the, um, see in the summary. And uh, if, if one of you have that summary up on your screen and can put the, um, the URL in the chat for those who may want to reference it, um, I appreciate that. Um, and then from there, we talked about what would it take to involve all of those people that we listed in the conversation. And one of those ways where we're looking at all of those different ways of, of doing so, we're putting a toe into so many of those um, in the background, but one of the ways it's very, very public is to just invite people to our next conversation. Um, it's, it's, it's so funny to me always um, when, when people are shocked that all of our meetings are open, all of our strategy meetings, all our board meetings, all our committee meetings are open. Um, and yet those are the same people when they're shocked that, that are lamenting that, well, you know, we really can't engage our community in very much. They don't really care. It's like, open the door, bring them in, invite them. Um, and, and so I'm just real glad that uh, we are looking at that list of, of everyone who will be affected and saying, okay, well, let's, let's all talk about it. So today where we're going to um, go is that second question in catalytic thinking, which is, for all those folks who will be affected. And um, we can talk a little bit about others if we have experience with them. So uh, I don't think anybody here right now is working at a foundation, um, but many of us have. Um, and so if you have experience that you can, you can share, we're really just looking at the question of, for all those folks, if we were reimagining resourcing and funding, what would good look like? What would it look like if, if the outcome was what we actually want? And I'm gonna step back a little bit and Angie and Justin are probably going to do more of the facilitating um, of this piece. But if we can all just think a little bit about what would good look like? Um. I like to offer a thought. Um, I <clears throat> don't work directly for the Omaha Community Foundation. However, I do um, work under a director of research and I have helped in a couple of capacities there. And um, I think like through the research and different things, um, it's very interesting when I'm working with nonprofit leaders of color to hear this um, barrier of the table like this concept of where is the table and how do I get to the table? And I want a seat at the table where conversations are happening, but that table looks differently for me to approach than it does for my white counterpart um, professionals. And I think that's the initial thought that comes to my head is um, that reimagining the future would mean reimagining how opportunities are made available to people and how intentionality is sought to create change. Um, I think one thing that I um, absolutely love about the Omaha Community Foundation is that they are trying to um, do um, things like participatory grant making um, in certain programs like their community investment program um, that really brings in um, committees and people of color or people who are representing the communities being served um, to that decision making process um, for grants as well as um, to um, the conversations and the change that they're looking to make. 
So that's just an initial thought that I have. Stephanie, I really appreciate sort of that that notion of where is the table um, and sort of the, you know, another way of thinking about what good would look like is asking that question around how would it feel different for people? What what is it that we would want? You know, so Stephanie, you talked about writing grants. Like, what would what would feel different if we had a system that that felt better um, for folks? You know, not only those who the whose voice you're you're um, presenting here, but even your own of just like you know the crazy that is so often. And I know Elaine too. You had some sort of experience in that realm too. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we were to think about some of the, the folks that are on that list and think about ourselves, any one of us who's had to do fundraising, um, you know, I, I, I know, I, I hear lots of the, that was icky, <laughs> uh, you know, sort of walking out of the meeting kind of thing. And so I guess the question is, you know, what would, what would be different if we sort of had things feeling good for people or what would good feel like for the folks who are actually involved in the, I'll call it the fund engagement process. Can I extend further that I think to your, just connecting what Stephanie said and Justin, your point and having, knowing, I mean, being at the table or even I don't know. Do we need the table, <laughs> or uh, but having a, a at the very least um, having a say in how those resources are are being conveyed, um, but also trust in each other to to be make to to yeah trust building amongst those um, folks. I was I'm thinking about. How often, um, yeah, there's so many reporting, the grant application, the reporting requirements, all of these things, all the hoops. I think you guys talked about this a lot at the last meeting, but good would look like not having to do all that, <laughs> I think. I, I, I just want to refer back to, to Stephanie. It's, it is really striking me the question of where is the table? Um, if any of us have to walk into a foundation office, it's like walking into the principal's office. Um, and there's, you know, for, for a lot of community-based organizations, I mean, it's intimidating for any of us. And for community-based organizations that are um, meeting around somebody's kitchen table, um, it, it's, it, it, it is a statement of power. And, so many foundation offices are statements of power. And we convene, we invite people all the time. Yes, you have to come up to the 14th floor uh, in our beautiful office um, and we will serve a spread that's fit for a king and we're doing this for you and, and we're doing it out of the goodness of our hearts. We really, really want to do something good. And, and, and that sort of blindness, that blind spot of not seeing um, that, that where the table is locating the table inside a foundation's office, literally, that if you want to come and have discussions, we're convening a discussion, it's right here. It's not in the community. So, so, so that question of where, um, beyond the who's at the table, um, but, but that question of where has just really struck me and I wanna thank you for that. I think the table concept has, has really stuck in the back of my mind in research, um, not only because of the where, but also, just this like overall umbrella idea that leaders of color don't feel it's as easy for them to access that table um, a lot of times as they do others have access to it. And I've even heard um, just this notion that um, Omaha Metropolitan, for instance, um, that if they were in another part of the country that it might be easier to find those funding tables like outside of even just a foundation. But um, so I think like each community um, for change would have to reflect um, as a metropolitan or a big city or whatever um, to ask themselves, are, are we inviting the communities that we're trying to fund? Like, are we like intentionally reaching out to communities that are 
um, seeking to make change within their demographic um, populations or whatever they, they serve. And, you know, if we can't answer that, yes, we are making this an invite and we are making this approachable and we are making it accessible, then we're not making change. Like we're not making progress. And that's, that's how I view it. There is, uh, yeah, Stephanie, when you first started talking about it, there was a thing that popped into my head, which was the, the very extreme side of this, which is there would be no foundations because they are simply a concentration yes. of inequity. <laughs> I mean, we just, we just wouldn't have foundations because we wouldn't have the tax system that creates foundations as a tax shelter, which is really, you know, so, I mean, what we've done is we've institutionalized wealth holding. And so, you know, it, in the ideal, it wouldn't be that. So that's the real extreme, but there's somewhere in between, Stephanie, that you're talking about that is, uh, and Hildy, as you were talking, which is, there is existing this power dynamic and this, um, this notion that foundations are influential as opposed to obligated. And if we could have that shift where suddenly foundations felt actually obligated to reinvest the, the holding and wealth and, and I mean, almost Angie, just some of what you were talking in a reparative reparations kind of mentality, which is to say, rather than us holding and trying to influence whatever is going on, we actually have an obligation to sort of flip the script, Stephanie, which is the funders have to find the table where the conversation is happening around social change. And, and they have the obligation to figure out how to disperse that money <laughs> in, a, in a meaningful way um, that was there. So, so for me, I think that would be, you know, we would see the total flip of where the power was um, in that relationship. I love that. Here, and I uh, want to try to take oh, sorry. up. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Stephanie. I was just going to say, respond real quick, that I, I love your thoughts, Justin. And um, I, I, I do love that vision. And I think that is a great thing to strive for. Um, I think in the meantime, we see um, foundations um, in, a, in locally where I'm at and other parts of the country. Um, trying to bring in these modalities of um, participatory grant making where they're having committees that are um, representing the communities that are then voting on who gets the funding that is that source of knowledge for their community. And, um, and I think that's a great like effort and a great stride. However, I think your vision is even better and even more empowering to those communities. I um, you started off in a place, Stephanie, where I always go, and and Justin, you've talked about it even deeper. And I I always ask like, there's an expectation that this is the construct and this is how it works. So in order to play the game, you have to come to our table. In order to be part of the receivers, you need to play by our rules. And I find it challenging to think about, we need to get rid of the tables and what would feel different was somewhere that was just a welcoming space for everybody to come. Um, and, and how do you create that? Because there's so many different culturally um, relevant places to come together. So how do we include all of that? So I always struggle with, you know, the whole conversation about inviting people to come versus being where they are and taking things out. And I think Justin, you were talking about that a little bit if I were interpreting them right. So when I look at how the relationships have been, we've moved or, or we work in a quadrant where we do things to people or for people moving to doing it with people but then going to it being by people so you know just taking it out to them and back to that notion of participatory um funding like just put the money out there i know that sounds kind of crazy but i'm a crazy person so you know what would that look like if you just put the money out there like putting food out in alleyways for people who need food to just come and collect whatever food they need. Like, what would that look like if it just put the money out there? 
And the other thing I have to say, which I feel kind of guilty about thinking, but I do think this way. I, I find that for some foundations, and uh, not all, but I find that corporate, especially uh, giving, corporate philanthropy, in my mind, is really um, a way of putting a Band-Aid on a situation, but it's a way of, like, there's a tax benefit for doing that. So if there was really heart behind what corporates were doing, it would come from a place where there is no uh, corporate write-off, where, where they could truly give and not give because you know, there's a benefit to them. So I, I don't like corporates putting their names on, we're doing all of this because we're giving our money or we're doing this activity, when really to me it's just... Yes, they have a corp, um, a social conscience, but if you really have a social conscience, it's like the um, unnamed giver. So doing good deeds without expecting a return, and it's just doing it and doing it anonymously so that people truly benefit. Uh, I've probably said way too much and all that. But anyway, thanks for letting me. Uh... No, thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Other thoughts around, um, again, sort of what would be different about the experience? What would it, you know, as we think about that list of, you know, the people who are asking, the people who are giving, the, <laughs> the people who are running the organizations, I mean, it's a long list. Um, what, you know, if we think about sort of what would be qualitatively different for them, um, what kinds of experiences might we want to see more of for them. I'm, I'm really struck by the sense of community and what Elaine is talking about. Um, I've been fantasizing for a while. Um, I, I love the intent behind participatory grant making, but as you say, Stephanie, it's a step. Um, uh, if I were to choose uh, what the experience would feel like, it would not have words like grant and uh, ap apply and aren't I wonderful, I'm giving you money and I'm receiving the money. It wouldn't be that. It would be that sense of community. Um, I, I've, I have the fantasy that I've been playing with for a while is um, almost a step beyond your sense of obligation, Justin, that, 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 um, that feeling of obligation, that they're not obligated to give the money because the money ain't theirs. Um, they are obligated because they're the ones, it, it, it's so interesting. The only thing that, um, that philanthropists, uh, corporate donors, foundations, the only thing that they have is money. Um, they have heart, they have intention. I'm not, I'm not denying that, but they don't have the skill. They don't have the connections in the community. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the stuff it takes to create the change that we're talking about, that, that any group is talking about. Um, what they have is, is a resource to help with all of that. So they have this piece of the pie and everything revolves around that piece of the pie. And what they tell us is y'all need to learn how to get money from us. Um, so it's a ridiculous waste. We've talked about this in, in the past. It's a, a waste of human resource. I think Carl, you may have mentioned it. Um, it's a, a waste of human resource. It's a waste of time um, to have to learn skills that these guys already have. They know how to get money. They've done it. They have it. So the fantasy that I've had is that their obligation isn't just to give more of what they have, um, thank you, Vu, for constantly beating the drum that they go beyond the 5% that in the U.S. they're obligated to give. Um, but no, it's their responsibility to find funding for the stuff communities need, period. And around that table that, that, that I'm envisioning when you talk, Elaine, um, that we're all sitting down together, we're all talking about what's needed, and the assignment given to the folks with money is go out and find the money to do all this stuff we need to do. Um, that it, it's, it's beyond their obligation, it's their job. And it's not just their job to give their money, it's their job to find money because they're obviously really good at it. They already found money once. 
So go find money to fund whatever we've all talked about is needed in the community. Um, I, I think I shared, and I don't think it was, it was um, in, in this group, it might've been someplace else. Working with a foundation about 10, 15 years ago, um, they were going to do a learning community. They're, they're a wonderful foundation. This is one of the most forward thinking foundations I know. Um, beautiful heart and really putting that heart and their values into action. Um, they were going to do to celebrate their 10 year anniversary, um, a, a huge grant. Five organizations were going to get $100,000 a year for five years um, to, to rethink some areas of, of what made a community healthy. Really brilliant. And they asked us, this was in our, our old consulting days, uh, they asked us to facilitate a learning community of those five organizations. And we asked them, if you had all the money in the world, what percentage of the organizations that applied for funding would you have given money to? And it came out to something like 90%. They said 90% of the applications were so good that they would absolutely, if they had the money, they would have funded them. And we said, well, let's include all of those people then in the learning community. It's going to cost you the same. If, if we facilitate 40 people, if we facilitate five people, if we say, and, and the thought that, that everybody wins, the thought that, oh, if everybody who has applied gets the knowledge and gets the, well, what would it look like if everybody who was um, applying didn't have to apply and got the money? We have this really cool thing that we're doing and, and we've, as a community, decided that this isn't a place we want to go. Okay, funders, go out and fund it. Get the money, find it. Um, it's just been a, a, a fantasy of mine that... Um, sort of tickled when you were talking, Elaine, so thank you. Yeah. Well, Hildy, I have to say, I, I sat on a foundation here and, and it's a bit different because it was a hospital foundation. So um, a hospital foundation's In this job, conversation, I know it's something that we've talked about here uh, and we're talking about where's the table and who is, where's the power dynamic, you know, which direction is this flowing, uh, is, is sort of the, the fun idea of the RFP uh, goes out from the people asking versus the people giving or the people receiving versus people giving. So you have to ask permission to give money or apply to give money to an organization or a cause or whatever, if you're a foundation or if you're some form of uh, entity that gives. So reversing the dynamic there of them coming to you or coming to me and saying, can we help? Can we fund your organization, or can we fund your movement, or can we help uh, use some of our resources to make this become a reality? That would feel really. Yeah. Thank you, Dimitri and Elaine. I know you were talking a little bit there too, um, as as Dimitri was talking. So if we come back. Yeah, sorry, he didn't pop up on my screens. So didn't know he was talking. Um, I was just sharing that I um, I sat on a hospital foundation board, and it is much like what you're saying, Hildy, in that the hospital needs the money because in Canada, and I don't know about anywhere else, the, uh, the government doesn't pay for the equipment that's inside the hospital. The, the hospital uh, bricks and mortar gets paid by. Uh, the government, but the all, all of the equipment that's needed to actually treat the patients is there because of donors and because of fundraising. So it is a different dynamic for um, hospital fundraising because people want to make sure they have the best hospital they can. And it's the job of that foundation then to go out and, you know, make it exciting for people to uh, give to the foundation so that the foundation can then supply the dollars to the hospital so that they have what they need to run um, a good hospital. So that it's kind of an interesting model, but it's similar in, in a sense that what you're saying is if this is where the money's needed, you as a foundation, go find that money, get that money, and then give it to those people who are doing the good and need to have that money. And I guess some fundraising works that way. Community foundations work that way, but they then still have only limited dollars. Like you're saying, they don't have all the money in the world to fund all of the people who come with their um, ask. So um, 
it becomes a challenge and then they need some kind of process to be able to then determine where the money goes. And then that in itself, how equitable is that? Can I um, jump in here to ask if we can, or I was just thinking about what does it make possible if there were no foundations, which Justin had mentioned, because I feel like when we have these discussions in my, in my uh, academic realm too, we have spent so much time focused on foundations and give, we give them so much power. <laughs> um, but what if we were just to ignore them for a while? And um, what would that look like if, um, if we were to not, and not only think about fundraising uh, without foundations, but also fundraising without just money, that it's more than about money, right? So other resources that potentially could be um, drawn upon. And so uh, anyway, I just wonder if we could play a little bit more with that of like, what would good look like if we kind of took foundations out of the uh, equation for a while? I have like to response to that, if that's all right. I know I've talked a lot, but um, so, I helped like uh, for, uh, for a bit um, um, grant writing kind of pro bono for a nonprofit on the East Coast at one point. And I'm not going to go into specifics, but um, they completely fundraised their entire budget and it was in six figures. And so that just tells me like it's possible. Like, and it was, you know, a very specialized cause that their organization served. And so it was very impressive that. They didn't look to foundations. They didn't look to corporate funders. They didn't look to anybody to get those big dollar, you know, gives. They they looked to their community. They looked to their supporters. They looked to their um, fundraising kind of uh, methods that I learned from your class, Dr. Ike and Mary. And just those kind of concepts um, and were what they did. Um, but I, I kind of want to spin this off a different direction, though, because I think my background is in social work and I always think of the macro versus the micro. And what I hear kind of is this idea that like it can't be the micro level change or like the individual organization or individual like foundation even change. It has to be the macro level. Like what does that systematically look like? And I think some of you have touched on different ideas that fall within that systematic um, paradigm, but I also have to wonder like, you know, as a social worker, I always heard, you know, meet them where they are. And so if meeting them where, they're, where they are is this idea of the foundations having to put in the applications to the organizations to receive funding, what's to say that it can't be taken one step further, like a social worker, and there's people who are staffed at foundations whose job is to literally go into the community, go knock on doors, make phone calls, and connect with those nonprofits that need the funding and identify them and say, okay, how can I meet you where you are? What do you need? What amounts do you need? And what does that look like for change to happen in your community? And so it's almost this idea of, you know, as a social worker, I didn't work in homelessness. I worked in mental health, but I know a number of people who did work in homelessness and they didn't tell like a certain, certain positions didn't tell the homeless to come to them. They literally sought out the homeless and that's how change was made. And so maybe the question is not like, wh what is this gonna look like? It's, you know, how is a systematic change necessary to make a bigger um, wave within the ocean? It's just such a wonderful image, Stephanie, of thinking about that. Uh, Carl, I saw you sort of pondering and... <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's an interesting question. And, and, and sometimes, it, even though it feels a bit of a fantasy saying, what would the world be like without foundations? You do sort of think, well, you could get to that world if foundations became irrelevant because we'd found alternative ways of raising funds. So it's definitely possible. It's not that big a dream, I think. Um, the most obvious thing that, that would result from me is that it wouldn't be about so much about money. It would be about accountability and the direction of accountability would change from, from upwards to downwards and you'd be accountable down to communities instead. And I think in some respects that will be more, that will be of more consequence than any of the finance that was, was sort of involved from, from sort of uh, uh, going downwards. And it's really interesting this, this, this thing about, about, 
the cost of the system. And I don't think we talk enough about that as a, as a sector or as a community, that it is an inherently wasteful system that, that we have at the minute, where I don't think anyone has, has ever sort of really tried to count the amount of time that we spend sort of doing this. So it would mean that we were actually focusing on the things that we're good at because, you know, I mean, hey, like, like a bit like no one gets into this stuff because they want to be a trustee and good at, or a, a, and they're good at governance or whatever. Uh, no one gets into this stuff because we want to fundraise. We get into this stuff because we have a passion about a cause and we're probably good at doing something about it. And it strikes me as, it strikes me as an inherently stupid system whereby someone who's good at solving homelessness and they've got real skills there in, in sort of helping people get off the streets is then suddenly expected to be a financial guru and a marketing expert who's good at extracting money from someone else because that's not their core skill set. So it's, um, there's a, there are arguments to be made about, about how this is, there has to be a better way that, that leads to a more effective sector. Yeah, and, Carl. And it, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Justin. It's it's I, my my only thought was it's not just nonprofits um, because I look at the the whole cultural meme of pitching in the social enterprise world um, where you're pitching venture capitalists, you're pitching, you're spending more time figuring out how to say what you do in a concise three minute presentation. Um, and, and yes, I'm going to look at the various levels of community and systems change, and I'm going to tell it to you in 60 very sexy seconds. I mean, so, so I think that it's, it's, it's the entire system. And, and the only other thought that I had is, is that mention of accountability upwards versus downwards. Um, you mention accountability and you ask people for what, and the first answer they have is for the money. Mm -hmm. We live in a capitalist society that, that has gotten more and more and more focused on the financial aspect of everything. And, and we, we financialize every single thing. What is the ROI of this and what is the ROI of that? Um, if we stopped talking about accountability for money and started talking about accountability for, for living the most humane, equitable lives, um, it, 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 it requires a change of conversation. Okay, go ahead, Mark. I'm going to try something. I may fall flat on my face on the first day on the bicycle, but I'm going to try this. We've been talking about cooperatives for, for quite a while here. Um, and the idea that a seller's cooperative or a producer's cooperative would be like a farmer's market. So you've got people from all over town that are buying the best price for their tomatoes. And this is what we do with, with fundraising, I think. I don't, I'm not involved with that world. I'm, I'm working for nonprofits for a lot of years, but never the fundraising except for raffling off wine baskets and beach cleanups. All right. I'm kind of done. So that's why I'm one of the reasons I'm here. So when you go to the market, you've got, let's say, a thousand people on a Saturday buying the best price of tomatoes that they can find within that producer cooperative. And the fund rate, the, the fund, the, the, the foundations are the producer cooperative. Whether they work together and set prices or not, has it, it, that's where the thing falls apart. But when you have a buyer cooperative, and if you look at Ace Hardware, if you look at True Value Hardware, their business models, what they did was all these mom and pop, pop um, hardware stores were going out of business because they were buying nails that were five cents a piece. Walmart's got them for a penny and a half and on right, right, keep going, keep going, keep going. So what Ace and True Value did, they contacted all of the hardware, mom and pop hardware stores in the United States. They said, we're going to become a buyer cooperative. So now all the Ace and True Value hardware stores are able to buy nails and sell them for a penny and a half because they got together and bought as a buying cooperative. I'm wondering if... The, if you can get, I don't know how this would work. Somebody else got to figure this out. But if you had mental health, a basket of mental health and, and somebody from homelessness and somebody from suicide and somebody from veterans, and you put the basket together as a buyer's cooperative and then went shopping for the best money that you can find. Just throwing it out. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think there are lots of really great ideas. I mean, Stephanie's sort of talking about the, the case management model and, and Mark, sort of that buyer's market model. Um, 
something that's percolating for me as people are talking, and, and I know, Angie, we want to move away from even just the foundation notion, but there's something embedded in this that I think when we talk about sort of the feeling side of it is trust. Mm -hmm. That, that there is, you know, the reason foundations do what they do is because someone could come back and say what you did wasn't in the charitable purpose. And, you know, so there, there's a system of distrust. So we, we, may have, we have to make a pitch because we come in distrusting. Um, and um, it, so, so I think there's an element, what, what good looks like is that we actually have a trust-based system um, where the assumption is it works <laughs> and, you know, the goal is to connect. I do think, though, that something that's sort of interesting is, um, and Stephanie, this kind of goes to your point of an organization that doesn't want to deal with government or foundations is because it's easier for them to build the trust relationship with individual donors, that's, that's what it, it, you don't have to come over, you know, so many. And so I think there's also, you know, I was thinking about this, that, that we don't have a trusted holder of public funds because people don't trust government. That's why we have the foundations because people don't want to pay the tax dollars because they don't trust government to hold that money. <laughs> they don't want, I mean, plus they don't want to give it up, but, um, but, but there's something missing in that we don't seem to have that trusted institution that can hold these funds, um, you know, I don't trust foundations to make good community-based decisions. I don't trust government to, you know, hold public funds and in public interest. I don't trust, you know, all of these things. Um, so it makes me kind of wonder, you know, what does a trust-based system look like um, when we have the need to reinvest in our communities. Because I think, you know, going back to Stephanie's, and, and I know we don't want to sidetrack too much, but the reason we need social movement is because of extraction, which is the financial system, which built the foundations, which built the, you know, the, the money inequality. I mean, the, the ideal here is communities would just have what they actually need to, to thrive. I know we're not there, so I think there is kind of this intermediary space that we really are present in, which is how do we re-envision a trust-based financial movement system? I mean, it really, it is money movement. Like we got to figure that piece out. So that's... yeah, Mark. I'm, I'm bursting, I'm sorry. Um, we, we are embedded in a system of competing for scarcity. And this is exactly how the money it derives. Um, and it, it has to do with consumer goods and everything else that we're embedded in. The, the middle of that is cooperating in order for people to share the, the amount of whatever is out there, but we need to work to the cooperation of not just sharing, but enoughness. And it's all out there. We know the money is out there. But I think that we, we keep falling back into this model traditionally of competing for scarcity. And that's mm -hmm. where we're falling down. Thank mm -hmm. you. Elaine, I saw that you had a comment and then I want to get Trey. I know you have a comment there too, Trey. Mark, that was uh, brilliantly uh, stated. I, I was just going back to the thoughts about feeling and how, how would this feel different? Like, I guess for the organization who needs the money, they need it for a good purpose. And it's usually for a social, social cause. And so it, it would feel more like part of their service. They're not coming to somebody that, whether you call it not trust or trust, but that is going to pass judgment on what that organization does and the population that they serve. And there's, you know, that's all again about how do you harness the passion that people have who actually create these organizations because they do have a passion and all the people in that organization have a passion to serve whatever group it is. And so how does the money really become and how does the foundation really become part of that passion? And 
uh, feel part of impacting the client so that everybody feels better about this client is going to be helped. Nobody's being judged about who you are, what you do, or are you more important than somebody else? And again, back to that, you know, rather than competition, it's co-optition. And somebody wrote a book about that a long time ago. And so I, you know, just to echo what uh, Mark was saying there. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Trey. So a series of thoughts in no particular order. Um, the whole idea of coming to the table, where is the table? Um, if there's no foundations and there's no table, then it's simply about conversation. It's about fractals, it's about networks. And then, well, if it's about the networks and it's about the conversations, then it's about expanding the narrative and having conversations about the thing, about the expanding of the narrative. So um, one of the things that we're noticing is the concept of what we mean by healthy agency. What do we mean by, um, you know, helping what do we mean by contributing um and and where when i start thinking about what would be different is that the entities or the groups that are in experimentation right now and are doing amazing things around this these these kinds of conversations and this kind of ex narrative expanding that the word about that needs to needs to get out more. It needs that needs to be disseminated. It needs to stop happening in pockets. It needs to be heard. It needs to be shared. It needs to be testimonialized, if that's a word, to the crap, you know, to the nth degree. Um, because there are some really amazing people with some really amazing intentions that are doing really leading edge stuff. Um, Trust-based philanthropy network, thriving, resilient communities, collaboratory, Lang Kelly Chase Foundation in the UK. Um, there's some really amazing stuff happening, but not enough people are hearing about it, are knowing about it and talking about it and, and actually peeling back the layers on the assumptions of the definitions of the words and the things that we're using. And as soon as we start having those conversations and peeling back those layers, it changes, it changes everything. And so um, I'm, I'm, that's part of the reason why I'm still here almost 15 years later, um, because I believe that this community is the kind of community that can facilitate and curate those kinds of conversations and can continue that ripple effect. And, uh, and I'm really, really loving the contributions of everybody here and, and uh, don't know how concrete that came out, but there you go, that's, I'm complete. Thank you. Thank you, Trey. Dimitri. Um. Trey, the conversations um, thought sort of blends into something that I was thinking about in terms of stakeholders who have an interest in maintaining the status quo. Uh, and what uh, comes to mind is healthcare. And, and I'm just sort of thinking about, you know, it's pretty obvious in, in this country that there are systems that can deliver healthcare with a huge savings in terms of all of the overhead costs that exist in private healthcare, health insurance and, and, and uh, how hospitals are organized, how medical systems work, all of the liability issues, all of whatever. Conversation between all of these players to facilitate kind of a mutual agreement as to where we wanna go. 
what's good for society, what's good for healthcare, what's good for whatever. So I'm using healthcare as an example of a really horrendous system, but not in this country, but not very different from what we're talking about in terms of not-for-profits in general. That there is such a, a, um, uh, a, a huge vested interest in the existing system that uh, needs to be part of this conversation uh, beyond the individual, uh, this foundation, that conversation with them, you know, this donor conversation with them, but just sort of a uh, coming to an agreement or an understanding of what amount of resource is being used in just, you know, what you were talking about, Carl, earlier was the amount of time at least what I got out of it is the amount of time an organization has to take to just report back what they did uh, uh, to an entity uh, uh, or where the, the funding came from. That that time and energy can be used to the outcome of what their mission is, whatever they're trying to accomplish. So uh, I, I, I wanted to actually just, I think, dovetail off of Angie sort of, you know, when you kind of said, well, what if we, what if we stop thinking about the funding institutions? And I think just as you were saying, Dimitri, this idea of, um, you know, where time and energy goes and Carl, what you're talking about with that um, and kind of going back to Trey, sort of this idea of a narrative. And I'm wondering if we can sort of take that step back as to say, okay, I mean, we all, myself included, can cast <laughs> disparagement upon what we see as wrong. Um, but I'm curious if if we, so to, to think about Carl's question around what people are spending their time doing, I guess one thing to think about is for the people, let's just assume there are people who have concentrations of wealth. There are institutions that have wealth because that's the dynamic that we're working in. But what might it look like for people involved in this process, both the people and, and if we assume good, if we assume good intent, which is that people, you know, those who have the wealth actually do want to genuinely invest it. <laughs> those that uh, you know are working in the communities want to spend their time working and figuring out the best programs. I guess one question is, what would this experience with funding, like what could it look like from the perspective of the CEO of a community benefit organization or the CEO of a foundation or a government grant manager, like what would be awesome in a system where it does feel that it's trusting and empowering? I'm gonna go, out, oh, go ahead, Hildy. The, the place that I'm getting stuck and that these conversations tend to get stuck is that we keep asking what good would look like in a really shitty system. And what I'm really wondering is, do we need to accept this as the only reality? Um, it, it may be the question is, if we had nothing and had to start over again, what would it look like in terms of resourcing social change? Now, if we were starting over again, we would start with a social system um, that doesn't have the degree of have and have nots that we have, and I understand that. But if we were looking at, um, at art and education and, and things that aren't necessarily human service, if we we're looking at the entire breadth of what it is to live in community, and we didn't have any of these systems at all, what would we build to resource social change? Or, 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 or let's not even call it social change, to resource healthy communities. Um, and, and what would that look like? Um, it, to me, I think we're really, really, and, 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 and we all do it. I'm, I find I'm doing it. I'm talking about, well, the funders would do this. And the funders, if none of this existed, because this really is crap, what we have now doesn't work for anybody. Foundations hate it. Um, God knows we hate it. The people who love it are people who make money doing fundraising um, and because they're consultants and they get paid to, to help us out of a really crappy system. So I can't help but wonder if the question maybe is bigger than what we're asking. Maybe, maybe if, we, and we work our way backwards. I mean, catalytic thinking allows us to work our way backwards to reality. But if, if, 
if we can imagine what would it look like resourcing um, healthy communities. Um, this kind of relates to what I was going to say, but I was just, I was going to say that I was going to go out on a limb and um, talk about a little bit about Partnership for Hope and how it relates to this idea of um, sharing of resources among multiple nonprofits. And I kind of think it goes back also to the narrative part. So um, Partnership for Hope, it helps aged out foster youth, but we have a shopping center that's free for them to get furniture and it's shared by 14 organizations within the community that are able to access it. But um, they benefit their clients, their case managers bring, you know, through the young adults and shop and all of this. However, like, like the thing that keeps popping up in my mind is that they're sharing this resource from one organization. But what would happen as a group of organizations if we shared our funding for the betterment of our organizations? And I don't know if that's just too crazy of an idea, but it goes back to this idea of, you know, maybe we need to recreate the wheel. And so that, you know, in community, um, in the different areas of, um, interest, whether it's arts or whether it's um, humanities or um, social services, like like what if those organizations that were collaborating together um, actually reimagined how funding was delivered and utilized in such a way that foundations were forced to make it less competitive and more cooperative? Um, because Right now, those organizations, we don't share all of our funding within the, the collaborative of organizations for this nonprofit because we're competing sometimes. Like sometimes, you know, we're, we're trying to all like get the funding we can get, but we are like, okay, but you know, we're gonna keep you at an arm's distance because we still have to write the grant application to the same organization or, you know, all of that. So it, it, it's like, if we make change though, it has to be larger and it has to, it has to be something that gains traction. And as an example of a group that if they decide to, instead of just sharing this tangible resource, they, they, share, they share financial resources, then it couldn't just like stop at one group. It would have to be like a number of groups that take on an idea like that for bigger change to happen at the foundation level. Uh, Trey, I saw your hand pop up and then Elaine. Um, just permission to share a quick story, if I may. Okay, uh, so, and it just, it sort of dovetails off of this idea of narrative and conversations and peeling back the layers, okay? There is a, a an organization in the United States called the Whitman Institute. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Um, the Whitman Institute is a very, very, very long-standing organization and the board members engaged in a very, very deep, deep dive into what does it mean to address the issues of our time. And through a bunch of wrestling, and it was wrestling, uh, what inevitably wound up happening was that the board came to the conclusion that the Whitman Institute and all the funds, all its holdings needed to divest itself of all of its funds and sunset, which is virtually unheard of for a, not, for a foundation to do. Um, and they are sunsetting this year. This is their final year. They took five years to sunset they divested themselves of all of their funds. And now what has happened is now they have formed what's the next iteration, which is called the Trust-Based Philanthropy Network. Hmm. And what's really interesting is that the, they were doing okay until they became an organization. Hmm. And now what has happened is now that they've become an organization, now the board members are obsessed with much like a startup. How do we keep it going? How do we keep it thriving? How do we keep it? Okay. And so I'm not, I'm not anti-organization, 
but I would just like to plant the seed that what they're discovering, because they're in the midst of an experiment, which rarely any foundation will ever, ever, ever do, is that they're discovering that it must be fluid. It can, it must be based in, if I may, collective enoughness, mm -hmm. not in turning into an organization, turning into a nonprofit, a cooperative, a whatever, but to, to keep the conversations and the ownership collective and fluid, much like how the diaper bank first began. So I just want to plant that seed to say that if I think of what would good look like, it's moving back to those original impulses of what do we each have? How are we better together? Right. And not having to formalize it under these structures that, that as soon as you step into them, start to demand that the hoops have to get jumped in a certain way, in a certain time frame, at a certain level of whatever is termed sustainability and moving past this dialogue about sustainability and moving more into a dialogue of what what truly assists us to all invest in our own ways no matter what kinds of capital we're talking about natural capital human capital financial capital resources however we're connotating value and actually stepping into that space and going okay so what is it going to take for us to thrive through transition? And what is it going to take us to invest in our resilience as, a, as humans, as a species, not as entities? And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dance. It's a dance. So we still have to have one foot in the old reality in, to some degree. Minimum viable boards are example of that. And we can place the other foot very firmly in some of this experimentation that's happening now, but nobody's talking as much about these experiments and, and, and the learning that is coming from these experiments. And so what happens is, is that when everybody starts embarking on these experiments, they're doing it from scratch instead of learning from the mistakes and the things that happened before and what worked and didn't work. And so, um, Anyhow, I just wanted to share that story and I'm, and I'm grateful for the time and with that I'm complete. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a great story. Wow. Um, funny thing that when I listened to the first meeting and then there was a what stands out for you, what I wrote down was a, a shared economy and a uh, paying for volunteer hours because there was a lot of conversation around volunteer hours right now in Canada we have this thing called CERB so if people don't have the employment that they had they can collect um, CERB from the federal government but what would it take for the government to actually pay people for their volunteer hours so that organizations can truly value the people who help them sustain the work they do and allow people the flexibility of giving of themselves and their talents, gifts, whatever they have to bring to an organization or to the community, and then being rewarded to it. Everybody does need money to live. It's just the way, I mean, that's just, we can't blow up everything. So how, how would people be gainfully uh, rewarded with um, the money that they need to to have uh, a sustainable life or to have the living that they deserve and want. So that's the thing that came to me. And then the other thought that I wrote down was what's getting in the way to move us from what is to what could or should be. And so, um, Trey, a lot of, you know, your story is somebody just saying, okay, what was getting in the way? Let's just get rid of that and start from scratch again. But, you know, what is it that's reasonable that's getting in the way that we could change how things are done? And back to um, uh, Stephanie's point about uh, collective uh, funding. So 
I, I have been carrying the collective enoughness banner throughout my work for the last couple of years since being introduced to that from Hildy. And so we do have funding agencies who are recognizing that funding collective impact with agencies coming together to apply is of benefit. So that's a, a that's a move in a good direction, but it's still, you know, coming back to that conversation about the foundations, those with the money still dictate how that money gets distributed. Thank you for letting me share. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Mark, I know you had a thought too we wanted to capture or hear. A, a fleeting one at best. Um, Trey used the word fluid, and um, I, I think about biomimicry a lot, and uh, we, we'd have to step back a couple of meetings to talk about um, leadership and the Canada goose falling off the front, and number two and three took the place because everybody knew each other's jobs. Um, but the biomimicry here, the, you said fluid, and I'm thinking all the money is behind a dam. It's the dam money that we're talking about. Um, and unless somebody opens the, the valve, the money doesn't come out. Whereas if we took the dams away, we've got a, a river that flows and the entire ecological systems that are involved with it flow as well. I'm just wondering if the money is stalling too long. I wonder if the money should be moving faster or be decentralized or, or, or something. I'm, again, another concept of just throwing it out. You know, I come back to um, the difference in thinking about resources versus money. Um, and again, going back to my thinking about if none of this existed, what would we build? Um, we would be in community um, with each other. And, you know, each bring that, that whole stone soup model, somebody would bring the pot, somebody would bring something to stir it with, somebody would bring water, somebody would bring carrots. Um, nobody would be talking about, I don't have money. They'd be talking about, oh, I got carrots, here's an onion. Um, and at some point, yeah, you, you need money. And there are people with money who would say, oh, no, I got this, here, put that in the pot. Um, that it would be a we, not an us and them. And there's so much in this whole conversation that's been us and them. And, and Justin, getting back to a question you asked probably an hour ago, what would it feel like? It would feel like us. It would feel like we're all in this together. And, and the current system doesn't. Um, I also want to just very briefly caution that we stop saying this may sound stupid and it may sound Pollyanna and it may sound utopian. Yes, it will. It's the only way anything happens. Um, and so we need to stop apologizing for, for wishing for something and wanting something and working towards something that doesn't currently exist. It's the only way change has ever happened. So um, that's, that's my mom voice, um, but, but I really do think that what it would feel like is, is all of us in community together and, and not venerating, oh, wait a minute, everyone step aside, there's the man with the robes on. So I'd, I'd like, I, Elaine, I saw there, and I'm just being cognizant of yeah. time and sort yeah. of how, how this is circled. And, and I actually wanted to ask folks a little bit of reflection because I think that the nature of sort of what we've circled around, what we kind of keep coming back to, what we can't seem to part from <laughs> in this thinking, um, I'm actually curious sort of what's resonating for folks and, and what do you think is sort of the next framing of a question that we need to explore? Because I think that that's part of, you know, we obviously have one that was put out there, which is, you know, if none of this existed, what could it look like? Um, but I imagine there are some other variations of, of kind of the, where are you feeling like we need to ask a question or, or, or what is it that we need to ask a little bit more about? So I'll give folks just a, a moment to kind of reflect on that. And then um, Eli, I'm giving you a heads up. I might poke on you because you've been so quiet to, to share first. <laughs> No, it's been really great to um, hear the thoughts of our new members, not new, but maybe uh, those who are here for the first time that I haven't met before. I've really enjoyed hearing Stephanie's thoughts, um, Trey, Mark, 
uh, great ideas. Uh, and for me, after, as I continue to listen to Charles Eisenstein's The Ascent of Humanity, you know, and I think Elaine said, you know, we all need money to live, you know? Well, the reality is that's not really the case. You know, we survived as hunter-gatherers without money for millennia. Um, and, you know, capitalism is a technology, money is a technology, which, you know, began with fire, allowed us to sit around, you know, sit together and order the animals. We stopped being so nomadic. We switched over to agriculture. We learned how to write new symbols to track wheat, which led to, you know, corporations, right? And a continued abstraction of life to the point where money is mostly notional. It's mostly abstract, right? Derivatives, right? You know, there's really, we've lost touch with who we are as humans and, and touch and, and, and food and tangible things. We live in countries and cities, further abstractions. So Charles talks a lot about living in the gift and the gift economy is alive and well, right? It's these organizations that we're talking about who are doing great work, who are uh, serving the homeless, serving those who need food. And I think we've all kind of like drank the Kool-Aid in many ways. And it's really hard to, to, to undo it, to come out of this trance, right? That it's about the money. So how, how to undo that trance? Right, I think is, is really the question. It's really kind of what we're all trying to do. And, and for me, it's about authentic relating and being in a community back to what Hilly was saying, right? Stone soup model. We all have, we all have uh, what pa Pat Lencioni calls, you know, working the, the six working geniuses. Uh, the geniuses um, are all the talents, right? You know, what's the biggest re asset in any organization? It's the people. Right, it's it's that galvanizing, that tenacity, that wonder, that invention, creativity, and if we could, if we could all kind of like inventory that in a very clear way to know who who loves and, and has what, then maybe that could be a step towards us transacting more in terms of those 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 skills and gifts, um, and less about what happens when you put a paywall behind them and monetize them. It's, it's difficult, it's, uh, it's uncomfortable, um, it's almost painful to see how much we've kind of like delved into this kind of place of, of abstraction and separation and competition as Mark was saying, but simply just being in, in, in Charles's group and just being around others who are at this level of embracing the shared gifts that we all have and exchanging them freely I think is what we're all trying to scale. And I don't know how to have a clear answer to that, but I think just acknowledging that it's not about the money deep, deep down, right? It's about us coming together, shedding the masks, being vulnerable, acknowledging the, the grave harms that have been done in, 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 the, in, the, world, in, the, in the name of advancement and technology could be a start. So I don't know if, anything tangible, but just kind of reflecting what I'm, what I'm hearing and thinking about these days. No, thank you, Eli. I appreciate that. Um, others, reflections, the curious question you think we need to, to further explore. I would love to know uh, that group that you're you're talking about, Eli Charles. Yeah, it's called the New and Ancient Story. I'm going to put a link in the chat. Uh, the New and Ancient Story, nascommunity.org. Uh, it's been an incredible resource for me. Yeah, and and, and I, I I do 100% agree with you. It's it's not about that. And and if I had my wish, and I'm not an expert on any of this, but if I had my wish. I would rather be living 2000 years ago in an indigenous community if I had my wish, because the basic principles were why, why would an individual collect more than they need? Because that would mean somebody else in their community wouldn't have something. That would mean that children would learn from living and they would 
learn from the consequences of the decisions and the actions that they took. It would be a world where we wouldn't have prisons because the people who committed offenses would be living with the people they committed those offenses against and would reap the benefits of their uh, convictions. Like th that would be my dream. Um, and, and when I say, you know, there is uh, an is world that we currently live in, and there are lots of facets to that. And there are lots of groups like the group you're talking about who are really working around getting away from that, you know, uh, colonial structure that's been put in place. And uh, there's this is and this should or would or could or ideal and for me there's things getting in the way and then there's how how do we get around those things there are organizations all over the place because everybody's got great stories about them and i agree with trey the more you tell those stories the more you put those examples out there the more people can go okay that i think is for me there's the Tamarack Institute in Canada that fosters ABCD, which is asset-based community development. And I work through um, our community groups to do that. And so that's um, John McKnight, who, who, who talks about that, and lots of people around the world who subscribe to asset-based community development. And then there's also another, and I, I wish I had the name because it, it was something I just looked at recently. And basically it's a shared community and people come to somebody, somebody hosts and somebody comes to that home where they feel comfortable because it's a neighbor and they bring gifts that they have. Like if I make buns or somebody makes butter, somebody has something to bring and that's how they acknowledge and appreciate a person who's bringing them their gifts as an expertise to talk about a subject like there's so many brilliant um, opportunities for people to change and I think you know the more we can put those out there people will find the model that they can gravitate to so that the more people who move to those models the more the old model will be gone and just to close, I have this statement on my wall from Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I read that to myself every day. So as much as I said, yes, people need money because we, we can't let, like everybody doesn't have the means to move to um, an alternative uh, way of being together and being in community. So we need, we need to find a way to get there. And so sometimes you have to have the evil that creates the old model come with you a bit until you can get rid of it. But thank you, thank you. All right. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Elaine. That was brilliant. Um, second observation in terms of things that resonate with me today is that this is such a good quality conversation when we have more of us here and, and have these sort of new faces. And, I, and please, 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 can you all come back again? Um, third observation, almost sort of kicking off from what Elaine said at the end and, and the Buckminster Fuller sort of quote, when you ask your question originally, Justin, about what's the thing that we should explore, it sort of occurred to me that you can read any number of articles at the moment, I mean, from some quite serious economists as well, that essentially argue that the financial crash of 2008 essentially ended that post-war settlement of how economies work, that it, it ended the neoliberal settlement, and that COVID has come along and essentially it's just accelerated the demise of that. There is... Economists will argue there's huge problems right across the Western world now where growth has slowed to sort of almost nothing. Economies are just not working for people. And, and everyone, I think, at the moment is looking for what, what's the next settlement, what's the, what's the next way that, that we will organise our lives. 
And I don't think enough people are asking the question of what's the role of community and let's say the role of philanthropy in that as well, because our existing models essentially are stacking up or supporting that old model that economists everywhere are saying doesn't work anymore. So I think the big picture type questions that we should be sort of trying to ask is not how do we fix what's, what's there already, and if I was going to be critical, I think I, I think someone said before, like, how do we get them around the table? Well, I don't think they ever will. They're never going to change. We've got to make them irrelevant. And we've got to think about what does that next model look like? And I don't know, I may be wrong, I don't know if there are organisations like, I don't know, the Sunrise Movement and so on, that, are, that have just ignored foundations and have just sort of gone on and done it. And maybe what we should be sort of trying to do is saying, well, there's no point having a conversation about foundations anymore, let's just look at what some of these others have done and see if we can mimic them instead. Thank you, Carl. Shelby has her hand up. Oh. Um, a couple of thoughts occur to me. One, I keep thinking about the piece I wrote so many years ago about the difference between movements and organizations. Um, and that organizations don't change things, movements change things and organizations participate in those movements. Um, so there's, there's something there and that again comes back to community. Um, I'm also thinking about is this something someone said to me in my investigation last year when I was starting to have these um, big systems conversations with folks um, and it is that in the social change arena, uh, in this ecosystem, it, it doesn't matter, nonprofit, social enterprise, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, we have, although social enterprise less so, in the nonprofit very specifically arena, we have a unique ability to completely reinvent the systems we work in because we don't have a profit mandate. And I loved that. Um, it, it, to me, it was so observant. Um, that uh, we could blow it up, start all over again and change absolutely everything um, because we don't have to live in that world. Um, and a business does, and a corporation does, and a small business does. And to some extent, the way social enterprise has been built, that needs to live in that reality because there's a profit motive. We don't have a profit motive. So there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, to the question, that you asked, Justin, in terms of, of what questions we might be asking. The thought occurs to me, you know, when we used to teach um, catalytic thinking um, in, in, in intensive cohorts, um, we used to talk about the fact that when you feel stuck in, in whatever the conversation is, it's an indication to go higher. And what that means is that we're not asking a big enough question. Um, we're asking what funding would look like. I think we need to be asking what community would look like. I think we need to be starting at the beginning and asking what would community look like? Start asking all of the conditions questions for, okay, what would lead to that community? And one of those many conditions will be how it's resourced. And we will learn about that piece from all the other pieces. And, and there's something big there that just says um, that when you're struggling, we need to raise the conversation higher. We need to have conversations that don't feel like they're immediately relevant to resourcing and are the only thing that matter when it comes to resourcing, which is why are we doing this in the first place? And what do we want it to look like? And I'm pretty convinced that we'll find the answer in those bigger questions um, and, and it will, at, at least create the context for, for what that resourcing piece needs to look like. But I think that we're, that we're, we're looking too small. We're looking, at, we're looking at one means rather than looking at the ends and all of the conditions that lead to that ends. Hildy, you took the words right out of my head, literally. Um, I, <laughs> I was like sitting here struggling with do I say like it's a systematic change or a systemic thing, or do I say it's a philanthropy thing or a community thing? But I kept landing on the question, is it philanthropy that needs to be improved or is it community that needs to improve? And that's just where my head just kind of landed. And then you said that and it was like, yes, thank you. You said it 
Perfect. Mark or Trey? Thoughts? I was just going to throw something in the chat. Uh, we're, we're trying to fix a problem. And that goes back to the negative one all over again. We're not trying to recreate something, not trying to recreate anything. We're trying to create something that works. Now we, we can do it. It's just a matter of imagination. At the end of the day, we went to the moon. Oh, it's impossible. We can't go to the moon. It's physically impossible to go to the moon. Well, I don't think so. I, I, just a, a quick joke because I, it just popped into my head and I'm guessing that it popped into Dimitri's head as well. About 20 years ago, we were uh, in, the, in the business turnaround business and we were turning around a, a resort hotel and their staff was just so stuck in this is the way we do things that they had huge palm trees out front and we wanted them to wrap those palm trees in those, those neon lights that you see all the time that things are, are wrapped in. And we called the head of maintenance and we said, let's get lights and let's wrap the palm trees so that everybody can see the facility is still here and still open. And he said, no, that's impossible. And we went, but I'm seeing it all over town. And he said, yeah, no, that's impossible. And so whenever we, we come across things that are absolutely possible, but somebody is just looking you square in the eye and saying it's impossible. I always think of, no, you can't wrap the neon lights around the tree because that's impossible. You know, Mark, I mean, I, nothing's impossible. Um, unless it's scientifically and physically impossible, it's possible. It was it was physically impossible to go to the moon, Hildy. At one point in 61, it was. Obviously not. <laughs> S science is still figuring out what's possible. Uh, that's there. Uh, Dimitri, I see your hand up. Yeah. Um. A long time ago, we used to tell, Hilde used to tell this story about what you're trying to accomplish, which is really what we're talking about here. What are we trying to accomplish? And it was told with the metaphor of taking a trip. Uh, I want to go to Detroit, or I want to go to France, or I want to go wherever. And I get in my car, and I spend all my time looking at the pothole at the end of the driveway. And I got to fill that pothole in. I got to fix the pothole. I got to, it was all about the pothole, and it wasn't about ending up in Paris or ending up in Detroit or wherever you, you wanted to go. So uh, this conversation and the bigger picture um, comment, Heldy, immediately reminded me of that story. Uh, yes, I thought about the impossible story too, but I was also thinking about, okay, what are we, what are we doing here? Are, are we just looking at filling the uh, fundraising pothole versus what does community look like ultimately? So that's the... The, the thought that is sort of gelling for me around this whole conversation. The, the final thought that, that comes to me for now um, is around origin stories and around the power of origin stories or perhaps even their origin experiments. Um, if I was to, I don't, this is a very long convoluted question, but to answer your question, Justin, I would want to go back and delineate the conditions that truly allowed the diaper bank to thrive before it became an organization. And to go back to those roots, go back to those conversations. And in delineating those conditions, understand a little bit more the sheer magnetic force that is created when that when collective enoughness is 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 in play. And and so my question would be what are the collective conditions or what the conditions that promote collective enoughness? Separate from structures, separate from hoop jumping, separate from, separate from, separate from. You know, I, and I, that, that would be where I would want to dig. 
because we have in front of us evidence. We have visible evidence of success that taps into what makes us human and putting the humane back into humanity, separate from what we might perceive as the have-tos of life. And uh, that would be a question that I would like to dig on. Thank you, Trey. Jackie, as you've been uh, frantically tracking all of us, <laughs> our crazy thoughts, anything standing out for you? Um, I think I'm landing on a similar thought as to what Trey just shared. Um, and I know Carl mentioned earlier also like the sunrise movement. And so I think that a lot of this conversation has been struggling to identify those things um, because we're all kind of in it. Um, and so I wonder what it would look like to look at the people that are already doing it outside of organizations and outside of the structures. Um, and I think, I mean, frankly, with COVID, we have an amazing opportunity because there's been so many mutual aid networks that have cropped up over the past year and a half. And how are they doing it? How is it working? Um, and so I think that's kind of where I'm landing as well is just what are those conditions that we know work, that we see time and time again work to create the conditions that we're looking for? Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Like, I guess for, for me, um, I, I keep thinking about, um, yes, Elaine sort of reflecting on some of what you were sharing and sort of where you would like to go back to and, and Carl, what you were saying about sort of the neoclassical. I also think, you know, this is a uniquely Western scenario of how we're having to deal with this money that we've imposed across the world, but, but we deeply, deeply feel, you know, in sort of the Western world, you know, many cultures have no idea what a community benefit organization would be because they just they there there's more balance um in that um so i guess i i'm a little bit kind of in between i think hildy i appreciate what you're saying about sort of that big question of what we see as community and what we see as people sort of having what they need to thrive and um i feel just with this group we're fairly grounded in that and i guess when i think about my question um I, I really am sort of caught in that in-between space, which is let's assume that we do have organizations because we are organizing. We, we organize thoughts and people and resources. We, we, we are always gonna be doing that. Um, but I'm really curious as a participant in that organization, that organizing sort of just that process, which I think is embedded in ensuring people have what they need, um, that, that we sort of make that presumption. Um, but what does it feel like to be fully resourced in that kind of work? Like what, and, and what is it, what is it really, you know, again, not in our existing system, but what does a system potentially look like where we all feel that we are resourced <laughs> and resourcing? I mean, that's for me, the community piece that's there, but really kind of like, um, so it is sort of a bridge between what's that larger notion of healthy community, but also uh, on a very kind of practical side, what does it really at least feel like in terms of, it, you know, being trusted, going back, Carl, feeling like my time is being used well, um, no matter who you are in that list that we said was affected, um, that's there. So that's kind of one of the curiosities that's, that's that I'm, you know, sparking for me. I'm the last uh, one, I think. The, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead, Hildy. No, I was, I was going to ask you. Oh, <laughs> well, I, uh, I really appreciate the idea of thinking more broadly about the systems and, and, and the community but I also am anxious. I feel anxious to get to like, you know, the figuring out those conditions and all of that kind of um, aspect. So I guess I'm in the middle of like thinking about how we can, we need to have, have that big, the conversation about the larger issues. I feel like 
Very much so. And I appreciate all of the great resources that everyone brought to bear. I wanted to add one more per person to check out, which is David Graeber and his work. Uh, he's an anth anthropologist, um, also talking about the gift economy to some degree. And um, but from a he's a, he's much more, I guess, curmudgeonly perspective probably than Eisenstein. <laughs> um, but you know what I appreciate about what I appreciate about his work is you know he kind of starts his arguments by saying let's rethink everything let's set aside what we're doing now and try to rethink what this could look like um, and you know it's so hard because we're in the system but to try to do that is what is really what we need to keep trying to do um, so anyway I uh, I'll leave it at that. I, I just want to echo those who um, asked uh, Elaine and Trey and Stephanie and Mark, um, come back and play with us. Um, it has been delightful having, having everyone here. Justin, thank you so much for facilitating today. Um, Jackie, thank you for, for we, taking the notes. Could we confirm the date of the next meeting? Just second, second Monday of October. So it will be the 11th of October. Great. Um, 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time, 6 p.m. UK time. And many times in between. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Um, we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Namaste. everybody.